Hello, everyone. This is Tommy, World at War Comics. And thanks for joining us today. We have another amazing guest. Um, but before we get into that, if you could please hit that subscribe button, hit that ring bell, that would help out the channel. Also, I want to let you know that we have a couple amazing uh, partners. We have Cien Chili's, the best hot sauce you could buy, C-I-E-N-C-H-I-L-E-S.com. Get your hot sauce, use comics at checkout and save 15% off your entire order. Also, go to um, ComicCrusaders.com, the best reviews in comics, movies, music, um, even interviews. Go to Comic crusaders.com today they are another amazing partner of ours all right without further ado we have the one the only mr graham nolan artist extraordinaire um man i hope you really enjoy thanks everybody well hello everyone welcome to world at war comics podcast today my special guest is mr graham nolan graham you know every time i have someone that has been in the industry as long as you have i always kind of like what do i say about graham that hasn't already been said but obviously <laughs> a writer artist extraordinaire you've kind of done a lot over the last 30 years and you've worked with a lot of amazing people and they've gotten to work with you but uh man welcome to the show i'm so excited to have you um it's a well, pleasure thank you it's it's great to be here yeah, yeah i'm you. digging on your bane statue back there that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i actually had this out when i had chuck on so i just left it out there since nice. it's gonna be on a couple of days later i'm a big a mcfarland fan as well so i collect a lot of his figures i don't um, think i have that one no, you don't. Yeah, this one came out about a year ago, but boy, they got expensive fast. It sold out really quick. And oh wow, yeah, this one's pretty cool. It's it's about a about a nine inch figure. Okay. You know, most of these are seven, but you know, it's Bane, so he's got to yeah, have yeah. all those muscles and that height to him. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Yeah. Well, I mean, Grant, I would love to kind of go back into uh, history a little bit and, and find out where this passion um, for comics started in your life. Sure. Uh, I first got exposed to comics peripherally uh, yeah. when uh, I had a teacher that brought a, uh, a stack of comics in. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I take that back. That's uh, that wasn't the uh, the beginning. The beginning was in monster magazines. Oh. You know, they had articles about comics and they would show right. pictures of what was coming on sale and what's coming up and all that kind of stuff. So that was the peripheral end. Yeah. The, the when I really discuss and I had comics in the house, you know, I don't know where I caught them, you know, <laughs> grandparents might have picked them up or right. traded baseball cards for them or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but then when my sixth grade teacher brought in a stack of comics for the kids to read at recess or after we were done with tests, that type of thing, yeah. uh, there was a Justice League comic in there. Uh, it's one of the 60 cent giants that had like, you know, one brand new story and then like a ton of uh, golden age reprints. Yeah. And that's the one. I think it was Justice League 114, 113, oh, 113 something like that. Yeah. Uh, great. It just lit me up. I was like, okay, I know <laughs> these characters. I know Batman. I know Superman. I know Aquaman from the cartoons and the TV shows of the day. You know, I grew up in the 60s and early 70s. Yeah. So, um, so I knew those characters and it's just, you know, it, it just, you know, light bulb went off, you know, and that's what <laughs> that's what kicked it for me. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And then as far as the passion for art, when did that start? Like, when did you grab a pencil? Was it immediately after that first comic book? You said, look, I'm going to try and draw some of these and maybe start. No, it, it was before that, actually. Oh, OK. Uh, drawing. Uh, uh, but I just didn't have a focus. Yeah. You know, once yeah. I discovered comics, I had a focus. You know, yeah. I mean, I was drawing monsters uh, and, uh, you know, things around the house or whatever, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, what what it what really turned the corner for me was it wasn't the art that, that really sparked my passion. Yeah. It was the telling of a story mm. is what sparked my passion, you know? Yeah. So like I, I could draw stuff and it was mm -hmm. fine, you know, and I, I, I got some gratification out of it, but once I discovered comics and discovered, you know, telling stories with pictures, right now that was, that was something different. You know, yeah. I never wanted to be an illustrator, yeah. uh, you know, or, or a painter or anything like that. Uh, I wanted to tell stories with pictures. Yeah. 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 That's so, awesome. And then as far as that storytelling, was it something that happened in school with the, with the teacher as well that had you write something and you just thought, wow, I could really, I'm good at this. Um, you know, I, I, I was always a fan of movies. Yeah. You know? And, and so, you know, I could see narrative art, you know, yeah. I couldn't, I didn't have the, the, the skills yet to be able to uh, break it down. 
yeah, into yeah. why things choices were made and stuff. But I did innately know what good storytelling was versus bad storytelling. You know, yeah. I could see, you know, <laughs> shitty TV shows yeah. or, or, you know, a really great movie, you know, how they would transition scenes or, or, or lead you into something. Yeah. Um, so I innately understood that and, and, and kind of gravitated towards it. Yeah. Was there a certain movie growing up that really sparked a lot of your interest that you watched in storytelling? And kind of stuck with you. You remember, like for me, it was Star Wars. Um, the GI Joe um, animated series was huge for me growing up. Um, that was kind of my entrance into comic books. To be honest, is I didn't realize they were a comic book. And you go to comic book shop, you're like, "There's GI Joe comic books." I didn't even realize that. You know. Uh, well, I, one of the great sequences that I've always loved uh, mm-hmm. was for the first horror movie I ever saw, which was uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Yeah, <laughs> not a great movie by any means, but it does have one of the greatest openings of any of the uh, 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 Universal Monster films, uh-huh. uh, where these guys climb over a fence and they go into this old graveyard and they go into a mausoleum, you know, and they discover the body of Larry Talbot, you know, who was the Wolfman there, and they they bring him back to life type of thing, and it's really moody and eerie, uh, <laughs> and, and the tension builds and it gets scary and then. It, uh, you know, shit happens. Um, <laughs> and then the movie starts to take a dive. <laughs> but that opening, <laughs> that opening was really great. <laughs> it's super memorable, right? <laughs> yeah, it was very memorable to me, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it was uh, horror kind of where you gravitated to for a long time and still do to this day? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That was my my favorite uh, uh, at, when I was a young boy. You know, yeah. I'd, collect, I'd build the, the model kits, the Aurora model kits. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I'd watch, uh, we used to, I was at the very tail end of what started in 1958 with the the advent of the monster movies being released to television. And that okay. started this whole monster phase that mm. started in the late 50s and, and went right through to the, like, probably mid-1970s, 1975, 1976, it, it died out. Yeah. But in the early 1970s, it was still going strong. It was at the tail end of it. They had the Universal Monsters. They still had... Um, the model kits they had the monster magazines like the monster times and mm. the famous monsters of film land um there was uh, uh uh all kinds of even commercials utilizing the classic monsters <laughs> and stuff so it was it was it was it was an in thing so um yeah. uh you know it, for some reason i gravitated towards that yeah yeah um growing up with that kind of rich history and horror and and even though, you know, some of those films might have teetered off after the first uh, opening <laughs> of it, <laughs> they're still very memorable. Some of them never got off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, they became a foundation, though, yeah. for horror moving forward, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. like today, is there anything that comes close to the impact that some of those movies in the 60s had on you that you see today? You're like, wow, that's really good horror. Oh, absolutely. There's, yeah. uh, it's almost like a second golden age. Yeah. Uh, horror films you know there's a lot of really great foreign horror films yeah. uh in fact it, during halloween i do um, um a, a youtube show called 31 days of monsters mm-hmm. and every day uh i pick a new movie and discuss it and, and you know get people to watch it stuff like that <laughs> and uh i pick old stuff classic stuff but i've i've been doing it now for about four years um so i'm running out of classics <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you know i'm always looking for new stuff yeah, I, I just saw one today actually that I hadn't seen from 1977, uh, The Sentinel. Oh, okay, I haven't and seen it. That was a weird ass, creepy movie. <laughs> really, it had a really great cast in it of old old time stars, you know, past their yeah. prime. But yeah. uh, it was it even had like uh, cameos, like first time cameos by people like Richard Dreyfus and uh, Tom Berenger. Wow, and <laughs> Jeff Goldblum actually had speaking <laughs> lines in it. You know, it was. Yeah. crazy movie did he you sound know? the same then as he does now like that unique voice in the way he kind of talks or well they dubbed him <laughs> <laughs> they dubbed him in the movie <laughs> <laughs> that's wild man yeah yeah you crazy. know when you hear him right he's so distinct just... oh yeah yeah <laughs> uh so yeah that you know i so there's still these oldies i haven't seen that uh, you know i'm always discovering um yeah and to answer your question you know uh, uh uh, James Wan does some really great stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. The um, uh, was it Insidious? Did he, would he do that one? Or uh, 
the one with the, where where he and the wife or the guy and the wife are the like the ghost hunters. Um, hmm. There's a, a bunch of movies with this, these characters, and then they did spinoffs too. Those are really really good. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm drawing a blank on the name of those right now. Me but... too. You know, only because you said that. Now I can't think of anything. Yeah, because you know it works, right? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> contagious. Yeah. It's contagious, yeah. And then as far as on the superhero side, um, I know Justice League was kind of your first comic, um, possibly in, in elementary school. Was there a certain character that you really gravitated to that had a large impact on your love for comics and superhero uh, side? Batman. Yeah, Batman. So from our uh, early... Uh, Batman, uh, Superman. Yeah. Uh, because I love the adventures of Superman uh, yeah. with George Reeves. Mm -hmm. I still love that show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've got them all on, on voodoo and, you know, I'll throw them on there and it's just yeah. so, um, so wonderfully, uh, honest. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I love that. The movies that. were incredible. Right. I mean, I can't tell you, I think I, uh, we were speaking with Robert Venditti and he talked about the impact that those uh, Christopher Reeve Superman movies had on his passion. And I find that to be kind of those movies, right. That came out that, really drove a lot of people toward the genre of superheroes. I don't know if that was the same thing for you. Well, I'm actually talking about George Reeves. Oh, George Reeves. Oh, I thought you said George Reeves. Reeves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, wow, George yeah. Reeves. That's, yeah, 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 from the 1950s. Those <laughs> yeah, are the ones yeah. that I love. Jumping out the window. and yeah. Jumping out the window, you know, yeah. standing in front of a, a, a big giant saw blade with his chest <laughs> out. Love that. Love oh, it. Yeah, yeah so that was awesome, cool. man. That's yeah, awful. and then of course the Batman TV show. I grew up with that. Yeah, uh, you know, the Batman and... era. Yeah, um, that was huge. The Spider Man cartoon. So that's where yeah. I knew that character from. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I knew all those characters. So the first time I would like go to a, uh, you know, a luncheonette where they had the spinner racks. Uh huh. Uh, I would. I'd look. I'd see those really brightly colored, cool action covers, and yeah. uh, those were characters I gravitated towards because I knew them. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh, Spider-Man, I know him. Superman, I know him. Batman, I know him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I discovered the Fantastic Four. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. I yeah. love this book. <laughs> and and the thing was like, you know, the thing yeah. and uh, uh, for the Marvel characters, the thing and Spider-Man were my two favorites, you know. Yeah. And so yeah. Batman at, at DC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Ben Grimm has that effect on a lot of people when they see him for the first time. as such a neat character. Kind of oh, the yeah. leader of the Fantastic Four, right? Yeah, Amazing. I've grown into him, you know. I'm, yeah. I, I'm ugly and I smell, I smoke cigars. <laughs> hey, man, that's just what happens, man. I'm getting there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can't, can't get away from that. Yeah. So, as far as your first entrance into comic books from a professional standpoint, how did that all go down? And was that something that you were bound and determined to do, or did you kind of fall into it? I was bound and determined. I, when I was 12 years old, I, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I never had a plan B in my life. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I was going to do comic books. I was going to draw them and write them and, and, and be involved in them somehow. Yeah. Uh, I ended up going to the Kubert school. For, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, studied under Joe. This is back in 1981. Wow. Uh, when, you know, the school was only a few years old. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, I had uh, schoolmates of Adam and Andy Kubert, uh, yeah. Bart Sears. Yeah. You know, we had a really, really great and talented class. Yeah. Uh, Mark sure. Pennington. Uh, There's a whole bunch of guys. Uh, Lee Weeks. You wow. know, we all went to school together, and um, and it was a great it was a great learning experience for me. Not just um, teaching me, you know, the techniques, but mm -hmm. also uh, the business of this of of, mm -hmm. of comics. Yeah. Uh, uh the uh the types of tools that you use um, yeah uh there was a lot to navigate and they did a really great great job of of doing that you you either you know when you went into that school you, you could pretty much tell who was going to make it and who wasn't okay um it's pretty clear by their when you see their work and their turn-ins and stuff like that but that's stuff that can improve you sure. know over time with a lot of work yeah. and that's what happened you know he did they just work you work you work you until you get better and better you yeah. know, through constant repetition. Uh, I only went two years. It was a three-year school. Okay. Yeah, I went one year, ran out of money. So I went back home to community college. Came back second year, ran out of money again. Uh, <laughs> but then I stayed. I stayed up there. I stayed in New Jersey. 
worked for an ad agency uh, and then would go in and out of New York uh, to visit uh, with editors and make appointments and show my portfolio. Yeah, yeah. And what was that first entrance for you? When when did you land that first job in comics? Well, my first job uh, technically was uh, through the school because uh, the editor of New Talent Showcase at, at DC Comics was Sal Amendola. And uh-huh. he was a uh, one of my sequential art teachers. And so he, he ended up buying two of my classroom projects for New Talent Showcase. Oh, wow. So that was my first, uh, you know, I, I, a, I got an A on it and yeah. I sold it. <laughs> I got paid <laughs> <A> too. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. And yeah. Can you kind of share what you did? One was a two-page story called, this is the first one, the very first uh-huh. thing. is a two-page story called The Fan. And uh, it, it was about me at a comic book convention. You know, I, I had the hubris to be behind the table signing autographs as if I was anybody. You know? I love it. I love it. You know, uh, and uh, uh, the second one was based on a joke that Sal had heard. Mm. Uh, really stupid joke, but uh, <laughs> it was a sci-fi story where this guy meets God and he finds God's a black woman, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> so um, that was my second uh, second piece. That was yeah. 1983. Wow, Those two wow. were bought. That is amazing. And then as far as your first hire, like a full-time position, like was there a, a little bit of this back and forth where you were kind of working outside of comics and working in comics for a while before you actually broke through? Or did you get hired right away and you were able to do it full-time? Um, no, I, I had to stay working in advertising for a bit, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. I, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think what the timeline was. I, I, I got a... a a job at Marvel doing an issue of Transformers. It was what they used to call inventory stories. Okay. Uh, editors would hire would hire new guys uh, to get inventory stories to a see if they can make deadlines. Yeah. Uh, see how good they were, and yeah. b to have stuff in the drawer so that when you know their regular guys you know got sick or something or 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 there was a problem with um, uh, uh, them getting to, to the printer, they had stuff ready to go because yeah. that costs that money. You know, yeah. uh, when, yeah, when, you, sure. when you stiff the printer on time and stuff. Yeah. So that's what they used to do. I don't think they even have inventory stories now. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I got hired for that. Uh, then uh, I, I got hired uh, to do a couple things at Eclipse Comics. Mm. Uh, and that's where I met Chuck. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, that's right. I yeah. was doing a backup story for Airboy called uh, Skywolf. Mm hmm. And Chuck was writing that and Tom Lyle was the regular artist on it. And so I came in and did like four issues of that. Uh, and that was the first time, um, first time I worked with Chuck. And, but I, but I was working with Tim Truman's publishing group. He had a packaging group called uh, Four Winds. Okay. And Chuck was part of that. And, mm. and Bo Smith and uh, Gary Quapis and, and um, uh, a bunch of other guys. Um, and then we all became kind of like part of this team. You know, and so I started working and doing regular work at Eclipse. Okay. So was that was like my first regular gig was working. Was at this Eclipse. in New Jersey or was this in Florida? I was living in New Jersey. Oh, in New Jersey at the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I never ended up going back to Florida. I, I, I stayed up north. Because I think Chuck was in Florida, wasn't he, during that time? No, Chuck was in Pennsylvania. Oh, Penn, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 He didn't go down to Florida till, uh till he went to work for a cross channel. That's who I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then, so you did Eclipse for a while. And then uh, when did you move over uh, to either Marvel or DC after that? Uh, DC was, or uh, Eclipse was uh, getting unstable. Uh Uh, So I I went up to DC. I think, uh, I think the first gig, regular gig there was working on the Doom Patrol. Mm -hmm. I did the last few issues maybe four issues of doom patrol before it got canceled to relaunch it for the, uh, is it Grant Morrison who took it over? Yeah. Grant remember. Morrison probably. Yeah. Yeah. I know um, you had a good run. Yeah. So they, they, you know, we did the classic one, me and Paul, Paul uh, Kupperberg, and then, um, then those guys took over. But then mm-hmm. after that, I, I started on uh, power of the atom. Mm. I took that over with issue number seven, I think. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I ran that one down to the ground till uh, it got canceled mm-hmm. with issue 18. And then I was offered a uh, Hawk world with, with issue number one. 
So yeah. Hawk World was like one of the first. That was that was really the book in which I came into my own as an artist. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd been floundering for a long time with style and yeah, technique and all that kind of stuff, um, and even draftsmanship. Uh, mm-hmm. But by the time I got on Hawk World, I was penciling and inking my own work. You know, I was being forced to think quickly. You know, where you don't overthink things, you have to mm-hmm. get it down because you know you, you you got only so much time. Yeah, and uh, I can see a difference. I can see like by issue, I think issue six. I look back at that and I'm like, wow, this doesn't suck. This is pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can see some. I can see some definite growth there. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. Was it something about the character or the storyline that you think helped kind of create that kind of stability? Like what caused it at that point, you think? Uh, it was it was more internal. It was more okay. me trying to, you know, get better. Uh, yeah. you know, I might have looked at Joe Kubert's stuff more because of his yeah. Hawk World or Hawkman, you know, mm-hmm. years. Um, but because it was a, a B-level character, you know, it wasn't like I was comparing myself to, you know, John Buscema or, mm-hmm. or, or uh, uh, Kurt Swan or, or any of these A-listers at the time, John Byrne. Um, I was just trying to to make that book my own. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, so just through hard work and study and, and uh, uh, breaking down what other people were doing, you know, it finally clicked with me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, came together. And then at what point did um, you and Chuck come together at DC? Was it soon right after that? Um, well, right after that, after I finished Hawk World, uh, I was, I started working on a Metamorpho series Oh wow! Uh, that I was, uh, uh, co-plotting with Mark Wade, uh, yeah. and I was going to do full art on, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I'm not sure about the timeline here. It was yeah. either prior to, it was either prior to Metamorpho, um, where, I got a call from Scott Peterson. I, I, I had shown my portfolio to Denny O'Neill and to mm. Archie Goodwin. Yeah. And uh, eventually the guys called me and said they, you know, they, they needed, uh, you know, a fill in on detective comics. Mm. So I did issue two, uh, 750. And then they said, well, they really liked it. You know, do you want to do a couple more? So I ended up doing, I think, four. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is that one? Two, three. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, I think I think I did like four of those uh, detective comics, um, and uh, then on the strength of that, you know, they were already talking about Nightfall. Yeah, and um, you know, uh, they were going to offer me um, the uh, Vengeance of Bane. Yeah, uh, you know, so I, I got a call from Chuck, and he says, "Hey, you know, do you want to work on this thing? You know, we need the, the, this new character designed and stuff." Mm-hmm. And I'm like uh i'm thinking about it i'm like oh, i don't know you know <laughs> and he says you got to do this you got to do this really this is going to be huge and i go really and he goes he says yeah so he talked me into it <laughs> i feel like this has happened before i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, he was he was on the inside so he he yeah. knew what they were planning and i didn't know yeah. you know i thought it was just gonna be oh, a one-off type thing you know right whereas yeah. at the same time I think I was working on Metamorpho and I was thinking, well, this is going to be my, this is going to be my big launch because I'm, yeah. I'm plotting it. I'm doing full art on it. You know, yeah. so with the Batman stuff, I was just penciling, right. you know, I thought, you know, and I, when they, when they ended up offering me detective comics as a regular gig, um, you know, I, I was debating on whether, well, do I take it or do I do this, you know, Metamorpho thing and really get launched, you know? And my yeah. wife is like, <laughs> you want to slap me because you wanted to draw Batman since you were, you know, yeah. cool. you know, here's your opportunity. Yeah. You know, what kind of a, you, everybody's going to see Batman. Who the yeah. hell's going to see better more? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're right. You're right. Pretty smart. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need that sometimes. I was mm-hmm. just going to ask you, you know, that, that story of uh, seeing Batman and knowing that's your favorite character. And then years later, getting the opportunity to be the, the main artist on that. I mean, that's, for me, that would have been an amazing feeling. I assume the same for you, huh? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I never I never felt uh, uh, paralyzed by the idea, though. You know, some people get offered their favorite thing yeah. and they, they freak out. You know, they're like, I don't know how to do it. You know, yeah. it's like 
Batman was a character I understood. I knew who he was. I knew how he thought. I knew how he walked in my brain and stuff like that. So when I actually got to put him down on paper, I never had to second guess it. It was like, boom, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. You know, I, you're, you're really busy. You're doing metamorphs. You're doing all these other things throughout this entire time. Are you drawing Batman? Um, just in case you get that opportunity and you knew the style that you would use if ever given that opportunity or did just when it came, you kind of came into your own like that. No, I, I was drawing Batman uh, <laughs> on the side, you know, like if I got bored with something, I'd turn yeah. the paper over and just doodle a picture of Batman or the thing or, you know, yeah. whatever, Spider-Man, uh -huh. you know, um, all those characters that I loved, you know, yeah. that was a good way for me to just kind of like loosen up, you know, and yeah. draw fun stuff instead of stuff that maybe I didn't want to draw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I assume when you're on a, a longer run, even if it's Batman, um, and you've drawn that character in every single way possible, just to kind of keep things, I don't know, interesting. It's probably nice to draw something else outside of Batman after a while, right? We all think, man, I'm on Batman. I could do this forever. You know, there's probably a point where you're like, I cannot draw this guy in <laughs> another minute <laughs> or I'm going to throw my uh, pencil through yeah. the wall or something. You know? But, you know, for me, it, was, it, it wasn't drawing Batman. It was a problem because uh, uh -huh. he, he's so... Uh, interesting and there's so many different things you can do with shadows and stuff with him yeah for me, it was all the other stuff it's like oh right. if i gotta draw the freaking bat cave one more time <laughs> yeah. you know or, or that, <laughs> that that computer in yeah. there that is in there i mean during my time i designed the um the uh what they called the bat bible okay. so you know, uh, you know, like I did these drawings of the trophy room and mm -hmm. the computer set up in, in, in the back cave and in Wayne Manor and the clock and, and all the stuff, you know, and then that was all put together in a book that was sent out to artists to use so that everybody could stay, um, you know, on model. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I I created the look of that stuff. And then by, you know, I'm like still drawing it years later. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I should have done, done a better design on this computer because I hate drawing <laughs> or something, you know. <laughs> How long was that Bible used? Because I don't think it's being used today. Oh, it's not being used yeah. today. Yeah. It, it, they, they probably stopped using it after Denny left. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was the one that was kind of keeping it all together for that, huh? Yeah. Denny was the anchor. Yeah. yeah. Denny was definitely the anchor. You know, he he drove. Uh, he, he was a great steward. Yeah. Of Batman. And that's a right. problem with comics today is like, you know, these editors, A, are incompetent and B, they're not stewards of the IP of the characters yeah. themselves. Um, you know, they I, Batman's unrecognizable to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Anymore. You know, his motivations unrecognizable to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, I think they've done a lot of damage and, 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 and Denny would never allow that. Yeah. That yeah. Stuff, you know, can you kind of talk a little bit about how important an editor is when you are on a, a title, like that relationship between artist, writer, editor, um, mm -hmm. making sure things are aligned, making sure Canon, like, can you go into a little bit about how important that is in a, in a good, strong, long run in any character, whether it's Batman or anybody? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I just wrote something recently uh, on Twitter about the importance of, of good editors yeah, uh, because it used to be, you know, uh, they would train each other, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the long time editors would train the next guy as the assistants and they would come up and become, you know, very competent editors. Uh, and, and that that's been lost. Now they're getting, you know, um, uh, tourists in mm -hmm. these tourists that just want to dabble in comics. They don't understand the art form or the medium. Mm -hmm. they, they really want it to be TV or movies because that's the stepping stone they want to get to. Yeah. And so they treat it as such. Um the other problem is that the uh, uh, executives now control everything. And so mm -hmm. they're setting policy up at the upper levels, you know, guys that aren't creative mm -hmm. or they're, you know, minorly create creative right. uh, aren't letting creative people do the kind of stuff that's actually going to earn them money. Yeah. Uh, back in the, the old days, you know, when you had these offices, um, Denny, you know, controlled the bad office. Mike Carlin controlled the Superman office, and then he had other guys that had the the, the Justice League, and and, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then characters that were ancillary to that mm -hmm. and stuff. And then each one of those editors had autonomy. So, you know, I I don't think that uh, you know Jeanette Kahn came down to Denny and said we need a story that's going to take Batman out. 
you mm-hmm. know, which was Nightfall. No, yeah. no, that came that came organically from from Denny mm-hmm. because, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Punisher and Wolverine were so popular and outselling everything. And the fans were saying Batman needs to be more like them. Yeah. He has to be more violent and kill people and stuff like that. And so Denny thought that was a great jumping on point to mm-hmm. show them why that's a bad idea. And mm-hmm. that was the whole basis of Nightfall. Yeah, was yeah. to take Batman out, put Jean Paul Valet in, and then uh, show them what a violent and, and murder yeah. murderous Batman would be like. Yeah, yeah, the repercussions, right, of going in that direction. Right, and the, and again, so that, that that's direction from the editor. Yeah, uh, yeah, who's 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 you know basically the captain of the ship, mm-hmm. and then you know he if he's good, he hires the right people and yeah. then lets them do what they do best. Yeah, you know, yeah. Teddy was a talented writer. So he understood story mm-hmm. you know, and, and how to express it and how to uh, um, uh, explain things. You know, he was he was a, he wasn't an artist, but, you know, there's some guys that that are that have some art background like Mike Carlin. Um, he went to school of visual arts, um, never made it as an artist, but, you know, he was an incredible editor because he could at least if there was a problem, he could he could pinpoint what the problem was in a story. Mm or a piece of artwork and say, right. this is working. Maybe try this, okay. you know, yeah. so to, to give the writer or the art or the artist some mm-hmm. type of reasoning for what, why it's not working for him. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, you know, today they just like, Oh, you know, this, this isn't working. You're going to need to fix it. What, what, what do you want me to do? Well, I don't know. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Now what? <laughs> That's what good editors understand that they understand writing and they understand art and they know how to fix things. Yeah. You know, so uh, Do the good best. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Graham. Sorry about that. No, 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 no. Fine. I was just, I was just finishing up saying that, that yeah, uh, good editor is hard to find. Yeah. Does a good editor come from the writing desk? You think that's the best editor or doesn't have always have to be that in your experience? Most of them have come from the writing yeah. side of it. The yeah. literature, you know, maybe they were, uh, you know, English lit majors or mm-hmm. uh, that type of thing. Um, but there are there are those uh, that come from the art side. You know, yeah. Larry Hama was one mm-hmm. uh, that comes to mind immediately. Again, Mike Carlin. Mm-hmm. Um, even even you know, Chuck wasn't a uh, an editor, but uh, Chuck started on the art side. Yeah, he to be yeah. An artist, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. and so he he does wonderful little cartoons. You know, but he can still tell he understands storytelling from a picture point of view. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like he, he could he can he can uh, put little they might be cartoony drawings, you know, but he can get the point across. Yeah. If he needs, to, you know. Yeah. Now, as a from an artist standpoint, when you're receiving direction from a writer in your experience, what's the best way to get that direction? And then obviously that collaboration, I think, is crucial between the the artist and the writer, because the writer is limited, obviously, to the amount of words you could use on a page. Um, mm-hmm. It's not a novel, right? It's uh, but on the other side, right, your art also has to tell a large portion of that story. I don't know if it's 50 yeah. 50. I think it just depends on the story and the page. But it, that's a real mm-hmm. important dance, I think, that has to take place. And I could tell as a reader when I'm reading a comic book, if those two aren't linked right in that story, you're going to see two stories coming out of that, uh, mm-hmm. that issue sometimes, which is not a great experience from a reading standpoint, right? As a fan. Well, I don't know how other artists approach it, but I, I yeah. approach it from uh, uh, the Will Eisner uh, point of view okay. that once, once the script goes to the artist, it's the artist's story now. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, yeah. so your job is to tell the story visually now and mm-hmm. you have a framework, like an architect has given you the blueprints to this thing and you got to build the house. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's the way I look at it. It's like, if I, if I'm reading a, a script and, uh, he's asking for too many actions in a single panel, mm-hmm. like, you know, the Joker's on a unicycle and he's juggling a ball, uh, with one hand and he pl- he draws a gun and he shoots uh you know the batarang out of batman's hand yeah. well the action of drawing the gun is an action yeah the shooting is an action the right. juggling is an action you know it's it's like you have to figure yeah. out well, what's the intent of the writer here yeah. what is he trying to get across well he's got to get the batarang out of batman's hand you know and you know so that's where you you 
you can come in as an artist and either tighten that up yeah. or expand upon it, make something interesting that he didn't think of that would be even cooler to get that point that yeah. he's trying to get across yeah, without, absolutely. you know, without messing it. Up. Yeah. And then having the experience um, with writers, how has that helped you from the writing standpoint? Oh, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's like free education. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Huh? It's free education. You know, I, I'd get professional scripts every single month yeah. sent to me. That I could dissect and break down the same yeah. way that when I was trying to learn how to draw, I would, you know, look at the comic artists who I loved and yeah. deconstruct what they did. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So if I do the same thing with a good script, it's like, oh, this works really great, you know. Yeah. Um, and I still do that, uh, like w when I watch movies and stuff, I, I deconstruct it and break it down. And so why does this work? Why does this resonate with me? You know, that type of thing. Pacing, mm -hmm. dialogue. I, I'm a, that's yeah. my favorite part is dialogue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can, you know, Quentin Tarantino proved you don't have to have much of a plot, but if you've got good dialogue, you can, you can make a good, <laughs> you can make a good story. For uh, sure. That's a, that's a, that's a real um, interesting uh, key to, uh, component for me. Yeah, yeah. When was that first time, Graham, um, in your professional career where you did become the writer as well? Well, uh, I guess you could say it was the fan, my very first thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's true. Good point. <laughs> that yeah. that I, uh, I wrote and illustrated. Yeah. But on, a, on any kind of uh, regular basis, um, mm. I would have to say when I was working on Batman, I mm -hmm. had pitched these stories, these short stories uh, called uh, Tales of the Batcave. Mm. And uh, I had dozens of them I wanted to tell. I ended yeah. up telling two of them, okay. uh, writing and illustrating two of them, because I wanted to do a whole bunch of them. Then they could have put them in together into a collection called yeah. Tales of the Batcave or, or Tales from the Trophy Room. That's what it was, oh, okay. Tales from the Trophy Room. Yeah. And uh, they were all stories about how Batman got this particular trophy. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, you know, th there's the famous ones, of course, yeah. the penny and the dinosaur. And those are the first two that I tackled. But I had planned on doing all these esoteric ones that, you know, came from stories, but we might not have ever seen them in the trophy room. But they were stories I loved. So yeah. tell that story uh, about how he got it. That's so cool. The trophy room. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I of course, I had Bill Finger, you know, wrote the original Penny Plunderer and Dinosaur Island. Uh -huh. uh, and uh so but i put a new spin on both those things i, I recreated it for a modern audience and yeah. um so those were like i think the first two things that i wrote completely uh i co-wrote stuff with chuck um uh -huh. like a joker devil's advocate mm. uh, the graphic novel uh and then uh uh, uh superman the odyssey yeah um and then uh, around 1998 is when i did uh, monster island which mm -hmm. I self-published and and wrote and illustrated myself, and that was really the beginning of my independence and yeah uh, and such yeah. So is that the year? When was the last year that you worked with uh, either Marvel or DC and went fully independent? Well, I got out of comics around uh, two thousand. Okay, uh, and I got into uh, syndicated newspaper strips. Mm -hmm which I was working on for King features. And I, mm. I was with them for 13 years. Wow. Uh, cool. Doing that. Uh, and then in between that time, there were, were there was a few um, uh, freelance jobs that I would mm. do. Uh, Cause I was, I was really bored doing that stuff. <laughs> and uh, at one point I had did a whole slew of stuff at Marvel uh, for their Marvel adventures line. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Oh, this is great. Um, I can transition to this and, you know, go over to Marvel and do, do stuff. But uh, just like everything else, editorial starts to change and yeah. there's goes my contacts and they're going to, you know, so, uh, 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 cross Jan had started up, uh, and they tried to get me down there at uh -huh. one point, but it was at the tail end. And, uh, I decided, well, I had a surefire thing with King features. I'm going to stick with that. And then right. cross Jan burned. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, that was a smart move there. Uh, yeah, that then, worked uh, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but then I it just got to the point where I, I said to my wife, Julie, I said, you know what? I can't do another day yeah. on this trip. You know, if I got to draw Rex Morgan sitting at a <laughs> fucking dining room one more time, 
uh, <laughs> or or talking on a cell phone. Yeah, I mean, how how, how I, I eventually started taking my own drawings of him on a cell phone and statting them, and then digitally dropping them in oh, because yeah. I could draw another yeah. another one like that. It, it was soul sucking. Yeah, uh, and so I just said, um, "I'm out." You know, I can't do it. You know, we'll have to. I'll try. You know, we'll, we'll make it work somehow. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, then I got approached, uh, by, um, uh, ominous press about my monster Island and they wanted mm. to do the, the, the sequel to it and reprint the original. Wow. It was like, and they were going to crowdfund that. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of cool. Um, let's do that. You know? So that kept me busy for a while doing that. Uh, I learned a lot of, about crowdfunding, um, mm. from the mistakes they made. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, uh, which is, of course, that's how you learn the mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. But um, probably more impactful than success, right? Right. From a learning uh, standpoint. When when that kind of ended, uh, and I, I thought we were going to do the, the the final part of the trilogy, um, they didn't want they didn't do it. Um, then I got a- approached by Chuck to work with him uh, and Sylvester Stallone on the Expendables Go to Hell. Yeah, that was another crowdfunding project that Richard Meyer. Uh, was going to um, run mm-hmm. and it's like oh wow that that sounds really cool and yeah. I learned a lot about the success of crowdfunding from how he did that wow. and then I started talking now Ch- I have to I, I have to backtrack a sure. little bit because, you know Chuck and I back in 2015 tried crowdfunding on Kickstarter for uh, Joe Frankenstein okay and you know crowdfunding was pretty new at that point and uh, we figured, well, okay, we've got we've got a name, you know, yeah. it's, it's in Chuck and Graham together, you know, yeah. this new thing. We thought this thing would just, you know, sell itself. <laughs> right? Yeah. It does not work like that. Yeah, it yeah. does not work like that in crowdfunding, and and that was the biggest takeaway from me uh, on that was that I mean we couldn't. I I think we might have raised a total of five thousand dollars. Oh wow. <laughs> On that whole project, it barely paid for the materials. Right, right. You know, anything else? Uh, but I learned. Yeah. <laughs> I learned so that when I eventually did break off um, after I finished um, Expendables Go to Hell, is when I that's when I said I'm going to relaunch uh, Compass Comics because I, I yeah. that was a, a corporation that I I kept going. You know. Mm-hmm. You need to be incorporated at DC if you needed if you wanted to write and draw your own stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was good. I kept Compass Comics so that I could write and draw stuff. Um, yeah. And they Compass Comics, so it was great. Um, and so I wanted to to uh, to to launch that line. Um, I, had, I had recently sold a a, a story to um, AfterShock called The Girls of Dimension Thirteen, mm. and. Um, uh, that went really great. I had uh, Brett. Uh, um, um, oh my God, I'm getting so old. I, I, I forget <laughs> the names. Uh, Brett, I want to say Brett Breeding. It's not Brett Blevins. Oh my God, uh, Brett Blevins is such a talented artist. He's so freaking amazing. And uh, so he illustrated that book over there. And I, I pitched two other projects to them, and they turned them down. And uh, those two projects. Uh, ended up being what I launched Compass Comics uh, with in the Nolan verse, and that was the Shinu and Alien Alamo. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's awesome. So, bad on them; they they turned it down. <laughs> Worked for you. Know. you. Yeah, those two <laughs> things uh, raised over uh, two hundred and uh, two, over two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that's crazy, man. That's yeah. crazy. That's awesome, though. I mean, congratulations, yeah. Graham. Well deserved. Uh, on on creator owned. How far back have you created some of those um, um, characters that are now part of the Nolan verse? Like, did were you playing around with that, like in your DC time, knowing that you know one day I would love to do my own thing? And maybe you you weren't thinking obviously about crowdfunding because maybe it didn't exist, but you knew you yeah. wanted to go in one direction and have your own uh, characters. It started in 1997. Uh, oh, okay, my daughters were young at the time and uh-huh. uh, I was under contract with DC. So they would send me everything they published every month. Oh, okay. And, you know, when I was a kid, 
if if my mom was going to pick up comics for me, she could go to the the local uh, luncheonette or Seven uh, Eleven or something like that, and she could pick out just about any superhero comic without having to worry about it. Yeah, uh, with the exception of Conan because uh, that one she had to give a second eye to because there's some uh, nudity in that, and I yeah. definitely <laughs> wanted that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. still is, and I still enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, <laughs> I was a healthy, red blooded boy. <laughs> exactly. That's the one I want, mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I couldn't do that with my girls. You know, uh, the the co- Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, they were all you know bloody or violent. Uh, and not action but violent mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and over overly sexualized yeah. um the female characters you know this was the 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 french cut you know mm-hmm. uh, to, to to uh tooth floss yeah. you know type of <laughs> outfits you know right. um so that's when right then and there i just said well i'm gonna you know i had some bane royalties set aside i was gonna take the time off live on those royalties while i created monster island mm-hmm. which was going to be in all ages um a book that adults could enjoy but kids could enjoy the yeah. same way they could read terry and the pirates back in the day that's awesome so that's how it started yeah uh i didn't you know i my timing was bad there too because 1998 things were starting to implode you know mm-hmm. that's when all the editors were getting laid off or fired or quit or retired yeah you know numbers were down uh I made enough money. I didn't make back my royalty money, but I had made enough money to pay for the printing. Mm. But the book has, has, has helped me in other ways. Cause if it wasn't for monster Island, I never would have got the job at King features mm. because I tried to syndicate it. Oh, and so yeah. They got to see the stuff. And so yeah. um, that book has paid for itself in many, many other ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I never thought of creating my own universe other than, the monster island thing and then when i came up with with joe frankenstein um even then i i i wasn't really sure about you know i just thought there were two disparate things but when i did the chenou uh the chenou was set in buffalo mm-hmm. and joe frankenstein was set in buffalo so uh, i thought well what if i what if i have a little you know toss off bit of dialogue here yeah. that would indicate that um that joe frankenstein was in this world that people right. knew about him, yeah you know and so i did that i i i threw a little awesome. line in there and that's when my my radar went off i was like you know what <laughs> um then when i got to alien alamo and i got to the end there um i put in other little uh easter eggs uh, yeah. that referenced monster island so that okay now monster island's part of this thing yeah and, yeah cool. uh, uh what else? There was something else in there. I even I referenced the Fantastic Four too. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. This is awesome. a NASA website, and the guy was reading it. And on the left, on one of the little news blurbs, was uh, Doctor Richards and crew return from a historic uh, uh, space flight. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and fun. then once I started working on Ghost of Matacumba Key, that was the one where I decided, well, oh, I, I'm going to actually physically connect all these things right. through this story. Yeah. And yeah. that one hasn't come out yet. It's actually at the printer now. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. I should have proofs next week uh, yeah. for the book. Or, or actually, maybe this week. I think this week, actually, I should have proofs for the book this week. Um but that's the one that's going to connect all the stuff together. And yeah. so now you definitely have a, a singular universe. Yeah. That's so awesome, man, to be able yeah. to build all that out over time. It's gotta be yeah, pretty a lot of it was too, happenstance, right? you know, it was like, yeah. uh, like I, I wasn't planning on it, but then stuff started to come together. You know, yeah. when I was writing the Chinu. I got to the end. And I'm like, oh, it's missing something, you know, I, it, it, it it's just, I, I'm missing something here. So, uh, I grabbed a cigar, I grabbed my dog, and we went for a walk. Uh And I got halfway to where I was going, and it hit me. I'm like, oh, my God. That's it. That's what I did. I couldn't get home fast enough. I'm like, come (laughs) on, let's go. (laughs) Because I wanted to write it down before I forgot. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I don't know. I think that's such a cool feeling, too, when something comes to you like that, and you know that that's like the missing link. Yeah. 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 And then I can't wait to tell my wife. 
you know, yeah. the, <laughs> I say, and then uh, they open the door and guess who's there. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. yeah if, I, if I go to my wife and I talk about comics, she'll just kind of roll her eyes. <laughs> like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're very lucky to have a, a woman in your life that understands. Well, if I was go talk to her about the Fantastic Four, or yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, Good point. Her eyes would glaze too. But if I'm talking <laughs> about my stuff, then she yeah, gets yeah. interested. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. So, what where can people go to find out what you're working on right now, Graham? Uh, CompassComics.com. Yeah, Compass uh, that's Comic my uh, company. That's my website. Um, you can get all the books that have been published so far. Yeah, uh, available on the site, and. Um, uh, you know, anytime I start launching a campaign, the next campaign, yeah. that, that'll be on there as well. Yeah. You can sign up for my mailing list uh, yeah. so you can be kept in touch when, when you know, there's sales on products or, or uh, the next uh, campaign that's going to be launching so you, you don't miss out on it. Yeah, yeah. And you have a, a crowdfunding campaign coming up uh, in January, February time frame? Probably right. more like February. Um, I don't like to start a second campaign until... Yeah. I have a campaign. Well, while I still have a campaign that's outstanding, yeah, yeah. Um, the Ghost of Matacumba Key has taken longer than I had expected, and it got pushed back because I needed to get the Joe Frankenstein books out, right? As well yeah, because it connects, and you have to read those first. Gotcha. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was an afterthought, but it'll it'll pay off in the end, and um, uh, it'll be worth the wait. Um, I've fulfilled everything, everything we've done uh very very timely and some yeah. of them even ahead of schedule sure, so yeah. the backers know you know yeah. that they're not going to get stiffed on this you know no, so, no, no. i'm sure your tracker already uh, speaks to itself yeah not so your first the, rodeo gram, to answer right? the question uh the answer is uh, yeah probably february i want to get uh, yeah. i want to start shipping some of the ghosts out probably it'll probably be january before the books actually arrive here Gotcha. some point so we'll begin we'll begin the the process and then i'll start the next book up is going to be return to monster island mm. uh because that one was published originally by ominous press yeah but i want that back under the compass comics banner so that all the the, the originals the monster island are all under the compass and then of course once you've got that book and and the original monster island I'll be working on the next campaign, which will be Escape from Monster Island, a brand new one, which is the third part of the trilogy. That's so exciting. Yeah. So yeah. Exciting. I, I that. <laughs> and also, I just sent an outline to Chuck for the next Joe Frankenstein arc. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, a, and I've got so many other things in the back <laughs> that I want to uh, that I want to get out there. But but some of these original you know, I guess if Marvel has phase one, phase two, you know, that I want to get out in phase one. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah before i move on to phase two yeah makes sense makes sense yeah. well graham i can't tell you how much i appreciate you coming on and kind of telling us your story huge fan i know a lot of people out there thank you Tom. Love your writing pleasure. love your art it's been awesome meeting you um I, I feel like i've known you it's probably like whenever a fan comes up to you like they talk to you as if they've known you for years you're like i didn't even know this person <laughs> but it's because <laughs> of your stories right that we've read for so long and your artwork, uh, it definitely, I don't know, when you came on, I'm like, Graham, it's me. You're like, yeah. <laughs> yes, how are you, man? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I do appreciate it. I hope we could do this again, um, especially yeah, absolutely. Your, uh, your next campaign is out there and we could kind of help. Not that you need my help or anybody's help, but. Well, I'll take anybody's help. You know, new eyeballs. You know, you always want new eyeballs on a project. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Graham, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on. I, I wish you the very best uh, holiday and well, thank uh, you. look forward to your next campaign. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a lot, a lot of fun, Thomas. Uh, yeah. Wishing you and yours a very Merry Christmas. Yeah. And uh, we will see you in the funny pages, friends. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks again, Graham. Appreciate you. Okay. okay. Right, bye -bye.